Welcome back, everybody, to the CPTSD podcast. This is season four, episode one. I am Tabitha Bird Weaver, your host and co founder of the CPTSD podcast. My mission is to help as many people as possible figure out if the problems they're having in life are symptoms of complex trauma and then what to do about it. So no matter where you're at on your journey, I'm really hoping and intending that there will be nuggets to support you along the way. So I have a couple of really exciting announcements. The first is I am in downtown Portland, Oregon recording this because I am on a wonderful um, weekend celebrating my 19th wedding anniversary. I never knew I could stick with something so long. Um, And I'm really grateful that my partner and I have repeatedly decided to be in this relationship and to support each other. So please join me in enjoying the background that we have going on here. One of the announcements that I want to bring to you is that the CPTSD podcast is expanding as we've been talking about um, over a couple of different episodes. And we've got a couple of resources. One is ready for you right now. You can go get it and the other is in editing production right now. Um, and so that'll be up within a week, week and a half or so. So the the first thing is there's a um, CPTSD 101 treatment guide. It is, I think, a definitive guide in figuring out if you have CPTSD, what it is, where you might have gotten CPTSD. So there's some assessments in there for you to take. Um, but then what do you do about it, right? And, and the goal of that guide is to help you find a therapist. And so there's a whole bunch of uh, questions in there to help you get engaged with the material in a way your material in a way that will help a therapist know if you're a good fit and how they can help you. And I'm really hoping that will support you um, finding the right therapist as fast as you can, right? The second item is called the CPTSD Toolkit, and it is a course that I have developed that is really talking about the different therapies that are considered viable, really, they work with trauma. And shocker to nobody who's ever heard this podcast before, cognitive behavioral therapy, while it has some really good and important pieces to it about thinking, isn't going to get you there with trauma. Because the whole nature of complex trauma is dividing the thing that com- that um, that CBT wants to tap into. And so it can actually feel hard. So we go over um, two theories and I think six therapies in that course that will tell you this is what you need to know about polyvagal and attachment theory. This is what you need to know about dialectical behavioral therapy um, and several other therapies, including energy psychology, which of course is something I will always advocate for. So if you are interested in that toolkit, take a look in about a week, week and a half, and it should be out. If you're hearing this after its release date on July 1st, 2023, it's ready for you. So. I'm really hoping that those things will support you. What we're going to do today and what we're going to talk about today, if I can get my notes up, is, and even if I can't, you know, I'll go off the cuff, but what we're going to talk about today are the symptoms of CPTSD, how they overlap and interrelate also with symptoms of standard post-traumatic stress disorder, but also how there's some overlap between borderline personality disorder and CPTSD and what that means and maybe we'll even be able to get into why. If that interests you, um, I would encourage you to know about one more thing, which is we have a community that is getting rolling at TabithaBirdWeaver.com called the Karmic Alchemy Community. And the point of it is for those of us who want to change the way we experience life the way we think about life, the way we move forward in life, kind of getting rid of that karmic stuff from our families. We wanna come together and support each other and be there for each other. One thing I know and that research shows is that healing happens in community. Now, for those of us with CPTSD, that's really important because our damage also happened in community or in relationship is a more specific way to say that, right? because CPTSD has relational components to it, and we're gonna get there. So I'm gonna blow through these real quick, but again, if you're listening, you can go to the YouTube channel and look at the um, handout or the spreadsheet that we're gonna put up right now. 
if you're a visual person and you want that, right? So the first thing that PTSD and CPTSD have in common is that there actually has to be a traumatic event. There has to be an occurrence, at least one, because that's the minimum for PTSD, an occurrence where you felt threatened to death or like serious injury, really serious injury, losing a body part, um, that kind of, of severe trauma. So think ER. Um, now, sometimes the ER doesn't help because the wounds that we're getting on that really deep level are emotional or psychological and those count, all right? So even though we're talking about trauma in terms of life or death here, when you are a child and your parent or caregiver is not available for you relationally and they reject you, that is life or death, okay? So first thing we have in common is an actual threat. Now, what we're gonna do is talk about the overlap between PTSD, with CPTSD and then CPTSD with BPD or borderline personality disorder because PTSD and borderline really don't have too much overlap at all. Now, I think as we continue to learn about neuroscience, we'll find that there is more overlap. Before we dig into the actual symptoms though, I just really want to come in and kind of like love on you for a minute and say to you that I would, we're using the word disorder a lot and um, and that's what it is because there are ways that we diagnose okay I don't think that it is the best term for what we're talking about today because what again science has shown us and what anybody who's done trauma work has known or experienced trauma has known all this time is that it's an injury it's an actual brain injury so just wanted to pop that in there, like be kind to yourself. There is nothing you could have done. There's nothing you could have done to change this. Now that is scary and hard, right? Because we can tap into that helplessness, but also maybe you can find some relief there that it isn't your fault where you're at. You do have some power to shift it if that is something you want to do. So here we are. PTSD and CPTSD, thanks for giving me the tangents. There has to be an actual threat, okay? The second thing that they have in common is this experience of intrusion. And that means you can't stop it, right? It intrudes. And what I'm talking about now are typically called flashbacks or memories, nightmares. But I also want to tune in for us CPTSDers that sometimes those intrusions are actually a felt sense right? So it's an, a body or somatic memory instead of a, a recall type of memory. Please understand that you're having those to protect you, all right? That is, what, that is what's happening, even though it feels horrible. So let's just keep an idea of kindness towards ourselves in this situation. Those intrusions are really time-consuming and overwhelming, right? And they will stop you in your tracks because you feel like the worst moment of your life is happening right now. It's really distressing. Another really big piece, and I think this is the number one thing that keeps us out of healing, right? The number one thing is avoidance. So we avoid m recollections or remembrances of the trauma. So here's an example, trigger warning if you need that. So you get assaulted in the parking lot at Target, and that's terrifying, but somehow you're, you're okay, you lived, and you're able to get back to safety, which is really important, the return to safety. And then you notice, I don't wanna to go to that Target anymore. Or maybe you notice, I don't want to drive by that side of town anymore. And so we end up ditching Target and going to whatever the equivalent is in your neck of the woods, a different store to avoid Target, or we'll go to a different Target to avoid the parking lot. We'll have to avoid situations where we see family members. You know what I mean when I'm talking about avoidance. Right, so, but that avoidance is the thing that keeps us stuck, even though in the moment it feels relieving. The last thing that uh, CPTSD and CPTSD criteria have in common is a sense of threat. I believe people who are uh, struggling with borderline personality disorder also feel that sense of threat, and it's pervasive for all of us. 
And that sense of threat leads to something you may have heard called hypervigilance. And so we walk into a restaurant, we know where all the exits are, right? We um, always know how we can escape or we're maybe jumpy or easily startled because fundamentally our nervous system is on high alert and we don't turn it off very well, if ever, which by the way is flipping exhausting. Okay, so those are the, the basically four criteria that share commonality between PTSD and CPTSD. We're gonna start talking now about the overlap between CPTSD and borderline personality disorder. And the first thing that pops up is both of these symptomologies have a real problem with affect dysregulation. And what that means is that our emotions are big or sometimes non-existent but there's a swing, right? There's a swing in emotion. And so if you've ever had that experience where you go, it feels like, I hear my clients say this, let's put it this way. I go from zero to 60 and nothing flat and there's nothing even wrong. That is so relatable. And I want you to know I get what you mean by that. However, there is something wrong. You have an injury that has not been healed and that is what your whole system is trying to communicate to you. Affect dysregulation is really uncomfortable and it can also damage relationships. One of the most painful pieces of CPTSD and borderline personality disorder, as well as some other disorders, is that there is a negative self-concept. So if you're somebody who makes a mistake and goes, stupid, I'm talking to you. If you think that you aren't capable or you're not worth it, I'm talking to you. This is a negative self-concept. And it's also something that you had no control in developing. Okay, this was, this was created by people caring for you and your temperament. But that's, an, again, another whole podcast. Temperament just means how you tend to come into the world. And there are five components of that that we'll talk about maybe another time. So if you are somebody who finds that you have distress in relationships, or maybe people come and go, or maybe you come and go from relationships, or maybe there's always tension, especially with a certain kind of person or types of people, this might be something for you to pay attention to as far as the interpersonal disturbances are concerned, okay? Um, now we're moving into things that are borderline personality related only, although I don't 100% agree with that. This is diagnostic criteria, as I've said before from the DSM. One is that there's a shifting sense of identity. And what this means is that at their core, people who struggle with borderline personality symptoms do not feel like they have a solid inner self and it is miserable. So that means that we're always trying to figure out how we fit into a relationship, a context, an environment, a setting, whatever it is, and then we change our fundamental selves to fit the environment. This was crucial for your survival growing up. That's my opinion. It's not a diagnostic criteria, but it happens because we have to be a chameleon to make sure that people accept us and don't abandon us. All right. One of the things that is really key and kind of a hallmark of the borderline cluster symptoms is the idea of real or perceived fear of abandonment. I said that wrong. Fear of real or perceived abandonment. It's really distressing for people with this symptom cluster to experience the thought of others leaving them. And that makes sense to me because uh, they were left when they were helpless and needed help. So um, there is this idea that you don't feel like there's a you. You feel like you have to fit every different person or environment that you're in. And the last is, and this I definitely have opinions on, is dissociation or paranoia. Now, I absolutely, with people I've worked with who have borderline personality disorder diagnosis, they absolutely feel paranoid sometimes, their words, not mine. Like, they don't know what's going on, they don't know who they can trust, it's certainly not themselves. And it is terrifying, it's a terrifying experience. And because of the terror that we feel when we're in these mood states, right, we dissociate. And here's where my opinion 
I'm just going to smear it over the DSM criteria. People with PTSD and CPTSD dissociate too. And so it's not really, that's not really a fair criteria, right? Although important. Now, some dissociation can look like out of body, or spacey, or zony, or flat. Some dissociation can work, look like hyper work or overload. It's a way to not be here. That's the idea. So one of the things that is really controversial between, in my field at least, I see people at war over this online, is the idea that we're really just looking at a spectrum here between CPTSD and borderline personality disorder, which may be true. That could be true because there is indeed a lot of overlap. So why aren't they the same things and why do we classify them separately right now? Well, the first reason, and this is political, so if you don't like that, fast forward for a sec. The first reason is that the research that's been done on most mental health for most of mental health's history has really excluded a lot of different groups. And so like women, people of color, um, lots of different groups, right? Those are big ones though in the United States. And so while we have these criteria, they don't always fit every person from every population because we don't know what that looks like. We haven't studied it. And so I do think that we're going to see a lot of change over time with how we treat trauma. We already have. In fact, this is the best time in my experience since mental health started to get trauma treatment. We know more, we can do more, and it's permanently lasting longer, right? So one of the things that is important to know about borderline personality disorder and why it may not just be something on a spectrum is that there is, it looks like, a genetic component. And so now that genetic component could be the thing that determines whether you get CPTSD or BPD from your environment for sure. But CPTSD has no genetic component at all tied to it. So it will be very interesting to see where these diagnoses end up. As for now, what you can do is notice your stress, notice the kind of stress, notice when you have stress, notice those symptoms and talk with somebody about it. Get some support um, because it does, the diagnosis is really there so that we kind of have an idea of what's going on as a professional, but also so that insurance can be built, right? And so diagnosis is not the end all be all. Lots of people heal and are never diagnosed. So while it's important to understand the difference in what we're talking about, it's not the thing that's the key in you healing. The thing that is the key in you healing is you being willing and available for that, which is hard and scary, especially at the beginning. And you being willing and available to form community, which is hard <laughs> and scary the whole time for me, right? Hard and scary. And so in order to heal, you're going to have to do some things that aren't comfortable. And I'd really love to support you along the way. Thank you so much for listening today. If you want more information, you can always go to TabithaBirdWeaver.com um, and look up the CPTSD podcast online on YouTube. Um, those are ways to connect with me. We have a contact form on the website. I'd love to hear any questions that you have. Maybe I can answer them in a podcast for you. I really want to emphasize that forming community is important and safe community is important. And so if you would like to join us as we start a community and build a community around connection that is understanding and on the same wavelength, come on over and join Karmic Alchemy community. And for those of you in the Karmic Alchemy community, I'm going to follow up this podcast with a conversation about why, regardless of diagnosis, if you have CPTSD, borderline personality disorder, I would say any personality disorder, personally, because let's not forget narcissists and sociopaths, right? They had childhoods too. If you have any of these symptoms, I would love to talk with you a little bit about why narcissism absolutely has been present in your life. Okay, so if you want to learn about Narcissus and Echo and why this relational experience we have is so long lasting and painful, 
come on over to Karmic Alchemy and listen to the intro video. So thank you for being here and I will see you for season four, episode two in a couple of weeks. Until then, keep it light. Take it easy.